back to you on the record. It's been a bit since I've done one, and it's not that I'm running out of records that I want to share with you. It's just that it's summer, and there's a lot more demands on time. But um, now I'm not running out. Um, with the records that Bill and Judy at Records and Tapes Galore have given to me, added to my own collection that I had prior to that, it won't run out for a long time. But today I want to look at a, a really cool children's record with you, and this did come from Bill and Judy. And it features Herbert Marshall in the classic story, The Snow Goose, which was written by Paul Gallico and adapted by Nate Wolfe. And besides Mr. Marshall, it's uh, guest starred or co-star Joanne Loring with a supporting cast. And it had the, the drama with sound effects and music. And uh, so we're going to take a listen to this in a minute. But um, this uh, is a, a 10 inch, 33 and a third album. And I like these because they're hitting harder to find. Not real hard yet, but harder to find. And they're from that transitory period when the, you know, the record industry was trying to see if they were going to do the, if this was going to be the standard for release, uh, longer releases, or if the 45 RPM was going to be it. Um, the, it then ultimately, of course, we ended up with the 12 inch album. But very, very nice story. I want to read to you uh, just briefly about uh, Herbert Marshall, what it has to say on the on the back of the uh, of the jacket. It says, it was originally intended that this space should contain a biography of Mr. Marshall prepared from material forwarded to Decca Records offices. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention this was released by Decca Records, sorry. His notes on himself, however, are so revealing and so full of dry humor that they are reprinted here exactly as he wrote them. And ordinarily this would be an unfair trick to play on anyone. But Mr. Marshall need have no fears, aside from the fact that he too, that he is too modest, his own words produce a picture of him that does not uh, credit, a uh, credit him as a, as a reporter. Born in London, England, uh, his father was Percy uh, Marshall, a well-known actor of, of light comedy on the stage. And uh, the son had no desire whatever to follow the theatrical profession, possibly because between the age of six, when he was first taken backstage, and 16, um, when he was removed from a private school because there was no more money for school fees, he had seen uh, enough of the theater to know that not all of it was glamorous and uh, easy. So he found a business uh, position in London, which he held precariously for two and a half years until he was uh, 19 when he was fired for um, uh, that word is kind of scratched out but uh, incompetence <laughs> anyways as an actor though he was anything but incompetent he first came to New York in 1921 in a play that uh, that failed and then back in New York in 1926 in a play that was a success and from then on, he knew the joy of alternating between New York and London, uh, the ideal life of the stage player. And in 1932, he came to Hollywood, um, and except for one of uh, two visits to his homeland, he worked in Hollywood thereafter. And then incidentally, too, a member of the uh, Monte Cristo cast, also a record for DECA, uh, Frederick Warlock was HM's commanding officer in the London Scottish and both were wounded in the same action. So a little bit of background on, on Mr. Marshall. I don't have background on Joanne Loring, but in looking up photos to use with this program, or this video, she was one attractive babe, let me tell you. Yeah. So anyways, we're going to take a listen. I hope that you'll enjoy Herbert Marshall in the Snow Goose. God bless you. Love you all. See you soon. On the record. They tell of the snow goose, all that know of her. But what they tell is only a little of the story. I know the truth because I saw that mighty bird 
saw calm and unafraid straight toward the leaden death and blanketing smoke of Dunkirk. But that was before the sea had claimed its own, and the great white bird that saw it all from the beginning to the end had returned to the silences of the Northland whence it came. It is not a story that falls easily and smoothly into sequence, and some of it comes in the form of fragments from men who looked upon strange and violent scenes. There you are, lads. Here's your drinks. It was a goose, a blooming goose, so help me. God, I don't believe it. A goose it was, jockey, a seated same as me. Men of all kinds and from every station. Did you run across that queer sort of legend about a wild goose? It was all up and down the beaches. You know how those things spring up? A wild goose? No, but I saw a tame one. A strange experience. Under the circumstances, a dash queer thing to see. Odd that you should mention a goose. I suppose some people might say it was a legend. Legend? No, gentlemen, it wasn't a legend. It wasn't really just a goose, either. Have you ever seen a snow goose? Have you ever looked up into the deepest blue of the heavens with your eyes straining to penetrate distance itself? Have you ever seen suddenly a black speck coming toward you? A speck that in the space of seconds is transformed into a black and white pinioned dream? A rush of white wings, black tipped, a thrust forward head, a strong graceful body like a great white sail in full flight. I have seen that, gentlemen. I have known a snow goose well. My name is Philip Ryder. I am not accustomed to speaking my mind, as I'm afraid that I have lived away from the world too long to be articulate. But I cannot have it said that the snow goose is a legend. So if you will bear with me, here is the story. By my own choice, I left the world of human society in the late spring of 1930. There were reasons for this choice of mine, among them the strange, misshapen body which God had given me. For I must have been a frightening apparition indeed. I bought an old abandoned lighthouse at the mouth of the Elder and the acres of marshland and salting which surrounded it. I wanted only to be left to my painting and to have as little contact with the world as possible. I was drawn to my lighthouse not only because of its isolation but because of the hundreds of species of birds which migrated there every spring. One November afternoon, three years after I had come to the Great Marsh, I stood in my enclosure, feeding the birds. I looked along the sea wall and saw a child, a little girl. She was no more than twelve, slender, nervous, timid as a bird, beautiful as a marsh fairy. She was pure Saxon, fair, deep-set, violet-colored eyes, and desperately afraid. What is it, child? I, I thought... I was... Come, child, don't be frightened. I won't hurt you. Come closer. What have you there? Sir, it's a bird. It's hurt it. Is it still alive? Yes, yes, I think so. Come in, child, come in. Let's see what's the matter with it. Just hold it here for me on this table. Please don't be frightened. I found it in the marsh, sir, where fowlers have been. What, whatever kind of bird is it, sir? It's a snow goose from Canada. But how in heaven came it here? You can heal it, sir, can't you? Yes, I hope so. 
Anyway, we will try. Don't be afraid. I'm not afraid. But I have never seen a bird like her before. No, nor have I in any part of the country close to here. Uh, she came to us from a very great distance. Wherever did she come from, sir? Well, I'll tell you all I know of her. She was born in a northern land far across the seas. Oh. Every winter she flew to the south to escape the snow and ice and bitter cold. This year, a great storm must have seized her and whirled and buffeted her about. You can see how strong her wings are. Yes. But the storm was stronger. For days and nights it held her in its grip, and there was nothing she could do but fly before it. Mm. When finally it had blown itself out, she dropped to rest in a friendly green marsh, only to be met by the blast from the hunter's gun. Oh. Yes. A bitter reception for a visiting princess. But it's not as bad as it might have been. In a few days, she'll be feeling much better. You and I will call her the princess. The last princess. Do you like that? Oh, yes. Now watch. See, see if she won't eat something. Here is some grain. Put it in the palm of your hand and hold it out to her. Hmm. Oh, oh, look. She's eating it. Her eyes are open. Oh, she's going to be all right. She feels much better. Oh, I... I'm going. I'm going. Goodbye. Wait, wait. Yes, sir? What is your name, child? Fred. Where do you live? With the fisher folk at Wickledress. Will you come back tomorrow or the next day to see how the princess is getting along? Yes, sir. Yes, I will. Goodbye, sir. <laughs> As she spoke, I thought of the wild water birds caught motionless in that split second of alarm before they take flight. Her instinctive fear of that strange, misshapen figure, which is myself, had been overcome by her deep concern for the injured bird. But when all looked well again, the child was caught once more by the sudden and full import of where she was, and in panic had fled from my side. The princess wasn't badly hurt, and by midwinter was limping about the enclosure with the wild pink footed geese. Frith came often to see her, and as her devotion to the bird grew, her fear of me disappeared completely. One June morning, a group of late pink feet answered the siren song of the breeding grounds and rose lazily into the sky in ever-widening circles. With them, her white body and black-tipped pinions shining in the spring sun was the snow goose. Look, the princess. Is she going away? Yes, the princess is going home. Look for it. She is bidding us farewell. Well, I think I'd best be going home, too. Goodbye, sir. No need for you to hurry, child. Sit and talk a bit. No, sir. Thank you very much. I think I'd best be going home. Goodbye, Frith. I learned all over again the meaning of the word loneliness. That summer, from memory, I painted a picture of a slender child, her fair hair blown by a November storm, who bore in her arms a wounded white bird. In mid-October, a miracle occurred. I was in my enclosure feeding the birds. A grey northeast wind was blowing and the land was sighing beneath the incoming tide. Above the wind and sea, I heard a clear high note. I turned my eyes upward to the evening sky, barely in time to see a dream of black and white beauty come to earth in the pen and come waddling forward importantly as though she had never been away. There was no mistaking her. It was the snow goose. I did not even wait to think where she might have been, but rushed to sail my little boat as fast as wind and wave would take me into Chelmbury and left a message with the postmistress. Oh, 
Good evening, Mr. Ryder. It's months since I've seen you. Yes, I have been away for some time. Would you mind delivering a message for me? Of course, I'll be glad to. Tell Frith, who lives with the fisher folk at Wickeldroth, that the lost princess has returned. Tell who? What? You know the little girl, Frith. Of course. Just tell her that the lost princess has returned. She'll understand. Oh. <laughs> That winter started the parade of years, the happiest I have ever known. Time was marked by the height of the tides, the passage of the birds, and for Frith and me by the arrival and departure of the snow goose. The world was now boiling and seething and rumbling with the eruption that was soon to break forth. But it had not yet touched upon either Frith or myself. I taught her the law of every wild bird that flew the marshes. She cooked for me sometimes, and even learned to mix my paints. But every time the snow goose left us to return to its summer home, the barrier was again thrown up between us, and Frith would no longer come to the lighthouse. One year the bird did not return at all, and life seemed to have ended for me. But the following autumn, the familiar cry rang once more from above. And the huge white bird came out of the skies as mysteriously as it had departed. It was more than a month, however, before Frith reappeared at the lighthouse. When I saw her, I realized with a shock that she was a child no longer. She had grown tall, slender, and hauntingly beautiful. As I looked at her, I felt the deep surge of my longing, my loneliness, and all the unspoken things that lay between us. We stood together in that spring of 1940. The world was on fire. The whine and roar of the bombers and the thudding explosions had frightened the birds. The first day of May... We watched the last of them rise from their sanctuary. Look, Philip. The princess is going with them. The call is strong, Frith. Almost impossible to resist. But somehow she doesn't seem as sure as usual. See how she's circling close to us. I wish she'd stay. You wouldn't be so alone if she were always here. The call is strong, Frith. For both you and the princess. When she flies away, I lose both of you. I mustn't stay. I have to go. Look up, Frith. The princess. Oh, Philip, she's not going. She's circling nearer and nearer. She's coming back. The princess is going to come back. Yes, she is coming back. And this time to stay, always. The lost princess is lost no more. This is her home now. Of her own free will. Of her own free will. Of her own free will. Yes, my dearest. Don't go, Frith. We need you, the princess and I. Oh, Philip, no. No, I cannot. I, I must go. I'm glad the princess is going to stay. You will not be so alone now. Goodbye. Goodbye, Philip. Goodbye, Frith. At first I had been afraid of Philip Ryder because I had heard such strange tales before I ever saw him. I will never forget the day that I walked along the sea wall with the wounded snow goose in my arms and stopped frightened at sight of the dark figure that appeared at the door. I saw a man, a hunchback with his left arm crippled and thin and bent at the wrist like the claw of a bird. But when he spoke, his voice was deep and gentle. And my fears vanished when I found that he loved very greatly man and all nature. He did not know how to hate. His heart was filled with understanding. Failure to find anywhere a return of the warmth that flowed from him. It was some months later when Philip and I sailed back to the lighthouse after getting supplies in town. It was amazing to watch him handle his fast 16-foot sailing boat with his strong right hand on the tiller and in a brisk wind the rope clenched between his teeth. 
As we disembarked, I noticed that Philip was strangely quiet. What is it, Philip? It's nothing, child. It's the war, isn't it? It's that you feel you cannot do anything. That you cannot serve with your fellow men fighting for a land that you love very deeply. Isn't that it? There are some things Providence never intended me to do. That Providence which is handicapped will show you what to do. If it doesn't, there is no God. I'll never say that, Frith. If there were no God, there would not be anywhere the beauty that is all around us now. I was very young, but an age-old instinct told me that here was a man whose heart was breaking because he could not serve in an angry world. I left him sadly, and it was more than three weeks later before I returned to give him the news that was on every tongue of a British army trapped on the sands of Dunkirk, a hundred miles across the sea. A British army huddled helplessly, awaiting certain destruction. I could see the light of Philip's lantern down by his little wharf. And as I approached, I saw that he was loading supplies into his sailboat. Water and food, bottles of brandy and a spare sail. He was pale, but his dark eyes were glowing with excitement. I knew at once that he had heard the call for help and that here at last was something he could do. Hello, Frith. Philip, are you going away? Frith, I am glad you came. Yes, I must go away. I must go away now. It's only a little trip. I'll come back. Where must you go? Dunkirk. Dunkirk? In such a small boat, Philip? Yes, I know. But our government has called any kind of craft that floats to head across the sea and haul our men off the beaches. But, Philip, you can't carry more than six men. And for a hundred miles each way, it's impossible. They don't need to be taken far. Only to the transports and destroyers that can't reach the shallows. I can make many trips of that distance with six or even seven men at a time. Philip, I know how much you want to go, but I'm so afraid. In that little boat, you'll never come back, Philip. You'll never come back. Please don't go. Frith, listen to me. Men are huddled on the beaches like hunted birds. Over them fly the steel peregrines, hawks and falcons made of steel, Frith, and each one brimful of destruction. Our men have no shelter from these iron birds of prey. They are lost and storm-driven and harried, like the lost princess you found and brought out of the marshes many years ago. They need help, my dear, just as our wild creatures have needed help. Don't you see, Frith? It's as you said. Providence has shown me the way to serve. at Philip. I couldn't believe the change in him. For the first time, he was no longer ugly or misshapen, but very beautiful. I will come with you, Philip. No, Frith. Your place in the boat would cause a soldier to be left behind, and another, and another. No, I must go alone. Will you look after the birds until I return? Godspeed you. I will take care of the birds. Godspeed, Philip. Goodbye, Frith. God bless you. Goodbye. I stood on the seawall and watched the sail gliding down the swollen estuary. Suddenly from the darkness behind me there came a rush of wings and something swept past me in the air. In the night light I saw the thrust forward head of the snow goose flashing down the winding creek where Philip's sail was slanting in the gaining breeze to fly above him in slow, wide circles. Watch over him. Watch over him. I tell you, it was a goose. Jockey, you seen it same as me. Go on, I don't believe it. God's truth. Oh, I'd never be sitting here drinking this glass of beer if it wasn't for that bird. A and him that was with it. Him? Who are you talking about? Tell him what happened, Al. Well, it come flying down out of the muck and stink and smoke of Dunkirk that was overhead. It was white, with black on its wings. And it circles us like a blooming dive bomber. And while we're looking up at it, round the bend comes as pretty a little sailboat as you ever saw. The bloke sailing her looks like he's out on a pleasure spin on a Sunday afternoon. There he sits in the stern sheets, holding the rope in his teeth. His teeth? Yes, with his good hand on the tiller and the crooked one waving to us to come. <laughs> Angel of death come for us. Yeah, and it's a ruddy goose come over from home with a message from Churchill. And now we enjoy the blooming bathing. I can take seven at a time. 
Come along, you men. Listen to him there. A blooming angel of mercy. Don't talk rot. Come on, get on your feet and let's go. All right, lads. Now, one at a time. Here, over the side. That's better. We, we thought it was the angel of death herself when we saw that goose. What's she doing here? Oh, that's the princess. She lives with me. She sticks to you like she'd known you for a lifetime. She very nearly has. She was lost once. She knows how it feels. Well, he brought us out all right, and then we watched him make trips all afternoon and all night too. <laughs> he was still going when we left, and he, he waved us goodbye, the bird with him. A darn good man he was. Another half pint, please, miss. Half an hour, Tommy. I'll get it. That's a good yarn, mate. I can tell you the end of it. Yes? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. I was in that show, too. Our tugboat was on its third trip back, loaded down with soldiers, when our skipper sees a derelict boat off the starboard bow. We goes off course to have a look, and we finds this here goose sitting on the gunwale guarding a man's dead body in the bottom of the boat. Struth. Hunchback he was. Just then there's a shout from the bridge and not 30 feet off the port beam is floating the biggest, juiciest mine you've ever looked at. Now, if we'd kept on our course, we'd have piled right into it. Well, we blew up the mine with rifle fire, and when we looked back, the derelict was gone. The explosion knocked her off and the chap with her. But that bird, well, it got up, circled three times like a plane saluting, and took off. Queer it was. Give us all a turn. Lucky thing for us, we went over to have a look, eh? Yes, lads. It was lucky you saw her. But that wasn't just a goose. That was the snow goose, flying straight to the lighthouse, to Frith, standing on the seawall, waiting, waiting. Waiting, yes, waiting. But I knew that he was never coming back. I had stayed and roamed alone on the great marsh. I had found the picture that Philip had painted of me when I was still a child with an injured bird in my arms. Through the canvas I could see his love shining like a pure white light. And so that sunset, when I heard the high-pitched, well-remembered note in the heavens, it brought no instant of false hope to me. As my eyes lifted to the sky from whose flaming arches plummeted the lost princess, the sight broke the dam within me and released the surging, overwhelming truth of my love. Wild spirit called to wild spirit, and I seemed to be flying with that great bird, soaring with it in the evening sky and hearkening to Philip's message. Frith, Frith, my love, my love. I love you, Philip. I love you. Godspeed. Goodbye, Philip. Godspeed. Remember, Frith, as the snow goose needed help, so all the world needs help. It was you who gave me faith until Providence showed me the way to serve. Keep faith, my darling. Keep faith forever. Goodbye, my friend. Goodbye. <laughs>